Hi everyone, this is Alex again, and today we're going to be talking about celiac disease. So this is actually a topic that was uh, chosen by one of our patients. They want to hear more about celiac disease. So I don't claim to be a specialist. I'm not a gastroenterologist. However, um, Dr. Young and I, we do see patients with celiac disease and a lot of patients with gluten intolerance. It's a real thing going on these days. But celiac is interesting because it's a diagnosis that we've known for a long time. And um, way back when I was in school, um, what I've learned about celiac was very little. And all I knew was that people were diagnosed when they were young and they had those um, uh, abdominal, abdominal distension, um, uh, malabsorption, irritability. And these kids were like crying. They, you know, they failed to thrive. And looks like they were born like that and um some of those kids were put on a banana bread a banana diet and they would be okay so it was discovered it was caused by gluten so gluten seemed to be the trigger for this celiac disease so the question um comes okay so what is um celiac disease exactly it's a not immune disease okay it's an autoimmune disease meaning that gluten seemed to be the trigger okay meaning people eat gluten and then they have um, a reaction an autoimmune uh, response to the gluten that they're eating and as a consequence you see that the their gut becomes inflamed and this is a a result of the gluten so you have this is a normal gut the way you see there the villi is these um like finger like um, formations that increases the absorption of nutrients in your gut and once you trigger an autoimmune response meaning your body fighting your own self then you start seeing this flattened surface in the gut lining which is a problem because it lowers your absorption of nutrients a lot so when people um, with celiac okay you don't know if you have celiac or not used to be that the the patients were diagnosed when they were kids now we see the diagnosis being made when people are in their 50s in their 60s even in the 80s i have seen it um adults like i said i don't see children um in practice i see adults but i have seen patients older patients being diagnosed with this disease and it's very concerning because they can be having this problem for a long time and it's undiagnosed so and this is the problem so it's a multi-system disease in in which the villi of the small intestines is start to be damaged and, and as you can see in this picture that's what happens um so it's caused by gluten so that's the main definition and and what is gluten gluten is a protein from um the wheat um, it's in um, in wheat it is a protein so wheat has this protein called gluten that is believed to cause the trigger the, the celiac problem but as you can see my picture here I have um, all the grains here they all come from a, the grass family and we always say celiac should be gluten free which means you know they should stay away from wheat rye and barley and a lot of celiac patients they still eat gluten free meaning sometimes they eat rice sometimes they eat even oats Uh, it's considered to be safe in conventional medicine Um, corn is considered to be safe so a lot of gluten products have these other grains in them and my question is a little conventional medicine states that only wheat rye and barley seem to be the problem my question is all the other grains that belong to the grass family they also have a, another protein called gliadin and i wonder if that still a problem for some people that have been diagnosed with celiac disease these days and especially if they are diagnosed later in life 
the symptoms of celiac, how do you know you have celiac? Um, so you don't know, let's say, um, let's talk about a situation with an adult person in their 30s, 40s, 50s, and, you know, weight loss, not very common, actually, I don't see um, weight loss being an issue, but I do see fatigue, anemia, iron deficiency, anemia, B12 deficiency, a lot of bloating, diarrhea sometimes, but constipation, abdominal pain. Abdominal pain can be a big issue with celiac. They actually can be in a lot of pain. Um, and uh, nausea, they have joint pain. Uh, joint pain, we see that a lot. Um, muscle pain, seizures can be another problem. Uh, dermatitis, her part of form is, it's a rash. It's, uh, if you actually look it up, the gluten rash, it's the celiac rash. Um, if you have that and you have been diagnosed by a dermatologist, that means you have celiac disease. You don't actually have to go through all the process of diagnosis. You need to be seen by a um, gastroenterologist to follow up with your gut problems. But if you have that rash, it's likely that you have celiac disease. It's actually considered one of the, 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 the diagnosis. Um, hair loss, of course, because we have malabsorption, um, canker sores. You see canker sores even with um, gastritis or, or GERD, you know, the acid reflux. But you can see canker sores with uh, celiac. Um, burning of the tongue, infertility, uh, miscarriages. You see, that's not just related to abdominal symptoms. It's kind of like a multi-system disease. That's why they call it multi-system disease because you can have other symptoms. Oh, you have celiac and you off gluten and you have no more symptoms. Is it that simple? Uh, sometimes it's not. Sometimes you can have, um, you know, you no longer have diarrhea, but you might have other remaining uh, symptoms that we need to pay attention. So those are the most common symptoms when it comes to celiac. Here's two pictures to show you the rash that I mentioned. The picture here to your left, actually, I have seen this in practice. In an, in an older patient, dermatitis herpartiformis. Um, I actually have seen that. This one to your right here, um, I have seen that also in clinical practice. So if you see a rash, you know, I think, you know, a skin rash, you should go be seen by a dermatologist and, and roll that out. Make sure that that's not dermatitis herpartiformis because if it is, then, like I said, you need to be look into, and that's interesting to see how a gut problem show up as a skin problem. Okay, so we've got to treat the gut, right? Got to treat the gut. It's celiac, yes, but it's still have to treat the gut. So, how do we diagnose? How do you know if you have celiac disease, not just a gluten intolerance? So that's a big problem. That's a big issue that people need to know. Why is it so important? Why is it important for you to be diagnosed if you have this condition? It's important because if you've been eating gluten and you feel uncomfortable and you have symptoms and you stop eating gluten and you feel better, by the time you get to your doctor and you say, well, I was having issues when I was eating gluten. So... Now I'm not eating gluten, I feel better. We can't test you blood test wise because the blood test will show up negative because you've been off gluten. So it's important to be tested as you're eating gluten. So there's a blood test that you can get it through your regular lab where that you normally go to. And this blood test will detect antibodies in your blood to see if you have uh, antibodies against this um, tissue transglutaminase, which is a antibody in your gut. So if that test is positive, that means you have celiac. Or if you have IgA, that means you have celiac. There's a problem with that test, however. Even if you've been eating gluten, okay, you have to be tested before you go on a gluten-free diet. But even if you've been eating gluten and this, this test can come up negative. So there's a lot of false uh, negatives with this test. Therefore, in the U.S., the standard diagnose, the gold standard for the diagnosis of this, this disease is small is the small intestine biopsy. Once you do the biopsy, 
then you can be diagnosed uh, with the disease. Another way to complement the diagnosis, let's say you have a, a negative blood test, but you have a positive genetic testing. So there's a genetic test. Your 23andMe will give you some of those results and your uh, regular lab also. We can order that through a regular lab, but it's the HLA typing. So if you have the HLA genetic mutation, DQ2, DQ8, or even DQ7, that means you have a predisposition to have celiac disease. You do not have it, but you have a predisposition to have it. So if you have the genetic test positive, and you have a negative blood test, you should still have a biopsy done if you have symptoms, okay? It's important to know, not just because for you to go on a gluten-free diet, but also to follow up on the progression of the disease. Now, here's an interesting thing, right? 30% of the general population have this genetic mutation. And in some other sources, they even mention 40 to 45% of the general population have this genetic mutation. However, not everyone develops celiac disease due to the genetic mutation alone. So the question becomes, are there other triggers for celiac? Okay. So one in about a hundred people in the U.S. have celiac disease, have been diagnosed with celiac disease, and about 85% of them, you know, are undiagnosed. About 85% of the U.S. Uh, is going around undiagnosed celiac uh, patients. So then the question becomes, other than gluten, is there another trigger? Because you have patients, I have patients with HLA typing positive that do not have celiac and been eating gluten just fine okay they might have minor symptoms but not a lot of the abdominal symptoms and certainly i've actually had patients with genetic uh with a negative biopsy so okay so we're going to talk about another other triggers but here's a slide that shows you an interesting process of the disease how it happens this is a very interesting and important slide to pay attention to so first thing to know is that wheat gluten is made from two proteins okay so gluten has two proteins one of them is gliadin all right so when you eat gluten here it you know it's broken down in your intestinal wall and enters your gut wall as gliadin and this gliadin needs to be broken down even further okay but it's hard to do that so the the actually the gluten and gliadin is quite difficult to be broken down in your gut so what happens is your body has this enzyme that calls transglutaminase this enzyme is what ha ha helps to break down gliadin okay so once that process happens and those two things become a, a, um, a structural compound so enters the microphage and the microphage which is a type of white blood cell presents this combination to the t cell in the body and if you have that's the that's the key if you have the genetic mutation meaning if the key fits perfectly meaning the hla typing you have the hla dq2 dq7 dq8 that means the fit is perfect so the t cell recognizes this as a possible pathogen as an invader and it creates an inflammatory response and activate your other uh, inflammatory white blood cells, your B cells and you, your T cells. And these cells produce an inflammatory response because it wants to take care of a possible invader. So this inflammatory response causes damage to the small intestinal wall and you go from having all these finger-like you know, structures, the villi to not have any. And that's a problem here. This is celiac. Okay. So now you have a um, whole body inflammatory response. Therefore, you can have joint pain, brain fog, muscle pain, all those other symptoms that we talked about. But now you also have a um, 
you know, flattening of the small intestine, which now you have low absorption of uh, 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 nutrients. So you see, it's an autoimmune because your immune system fights your body. It starts to destroy your own gut, but it's not an invader. It's, it's just gluten. Another theory is that um, we might need something else to trigger the disease other than gluten. Because like I said, 30 to 40 percent of the population have the genetic mutation, but not everyone develops the disease. So this paper is saying that it's possible a viral trigger. You've possibly been exposed to a virus that triggered the disease. So in the paper, they actually show that in order to develop celiac disease, it looks like you have to have a specific type of virus invading your system along with gluten in order to have an inflammatory response. You see, they test this, um, uh, this paper showed that they tested with a different type of virus and the virus entered the system, damages the intestinal wall, but it's the, the body is able to recover. And this specific type of virus, when it enters the system, it seemed to cause some sort of like leaky gut, as you can see here, and then create this whole inflammatory pathway. And now you have, you know, celiac disease, or they even mentioned, uh, they talk about gluten intolerance. I wonder if that would be a cause of just gluten intolerance, intolerance and not necessarily celiac disease. So that's like another factor. So it's, 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 it, it's known in a medical community that understands celiac that it's possible that, you know, we've been exposed, these people have been exposed to something else other than gluten. Um, this is very interesting. So microbial, okay, microbial transglutaminase can be a potential player in celiac disease. This paper was published in 2019, Clinical Immunology. So microbial transgluminase is heavily used in processed food products and are unlabeled. So you do not know if you're eating this thing. What is this? What is this? So remember I showed you in the other slide that we actually have transglutaminase in our bodies and it's what helps to break down the protein of the gluten we have that in the human body we call that tissue transglutaminase the food industry uh, the processed food industry they actually can make that enzyme from um, microbes you know they have bacteria growing that and that uh, microbial transgluminase can seem to be a trigger for celiac disease. So this paper says, okay, so where do they put this stuff? They put that stuff in protein, um, um, in, in, in basically processed foods, okay, to improve the shelf life and, and improve the texture. So if you actually Google meat glue, you're going to find how they use this stuff in, in processed food. So it looks like this could be a trigger. And this other slide here, as you can see, this is the gluten free society. Okay. So as you can see, they have this, uh, what they call meat glue. See, microbial transglutaminase. They put that in meat, dairy, processed food, seafood. Restaurants actually use that to make meat you know from cheaper um types of meat to make it look better to taste better to look put it put together um now you, you don't know let's say you're celiac right so you're celiac you diagnosed celiac had a biopsy your doctor told you're not supposed to be eating gluten now you're eating cheese because you think well i'm not lactose intolerant so i should be able to eat cheese and you're eating this thing that you know it's contributing for your illness to get worse because that's where the antibodies are, right? You make antibodies against that enzyme right there. That's that's how the test is even done. It goes tissue transgluminase antibodies. So the, the point being that looks like the question is, 
And a question that was raised was, does your immune system response to this microbial transglutaminase as the same way it would respond to your human tissue uh, transglutaminase? And it looks like that, yes, that's the case. So um, I'm gonna show you here, there is a paper. So this paper says um, that microbial transglutaminase is immunogenic and potentially pathogenic in pediatric celiac. So that's concerning. So we know that for celiac patients and for pediatric celiac patients, this meat glue can be definitely a problem. So in somebody lo looks like there's other triggers. This paper here was published in 2015 and they are actually just going about, you know, different ways of treating celiac disease as far as looking at the whole um, genetic aspect of the, the disease. Of course, it makes sense, right? If you have one genetic mutation, what if you have another one that could also be linked to other gut problems? So they put everything in the computer. Um, it was an actual computer analysis and they were able to see all the genetic mutations here to the right, see that, the, that it's actually linked to celiac disease, but that also have been linked to other diseases such as inflammatory bowel disease, um, um, diabetes one, vitiligo, asthma, Crohn's disease. So they're taking a look at this as a whole um, uh, genetic problem, um, uh, like a cluster of genetic mutations, because it varies so much from celiac patients to celiac patients. You can have a celiac patient that have a major reaction to minute doses of gluten and other patients, not so much. Um, Per guidelines, 20 parts per billion, it's allowed in, 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 in the food industry or in medications. And for celiacs, for some celiac patients, that's a major problem because they really react to minute doses. And this might be one of the reasons why, because we might be dealing with other genetic mutations that can affect their, their response to gluten. The other problem is how to follow up on the diagnosis. Like I said, the gold standard is the biopsy. So we'll do the biopsy and let's say it's positive, you have celiac, now you're gonna go on a gluten-free diet and what happens then after that? Oh, your symptoms go away. Oh, that's great, fantastic. But does your gut recover, you know, and how long does it take? Okay, well, let's let's do another biopsy. So how often are you gonna do a biopsy every year, every two years, every three years? So they're trying to find different ways to follow up in the actual gut and see if the villi has recovered or not, because it's important to know if, you, if your symptoms go away on a gluten-free diet, that's great. But if you still have um, flatten of the intestinal villi, that actually can be a problem because that means chronic disease. That means that your your diet is definitely not clean, 100% of gluten, and that can shorten your lifespan. And uh, also celiac has been linked to lymphoma, uh, stomach cancer. So untreated, untreated celiac disease, it's it, it can be a problem. For that reason, this paper in 2012, they're looking into doing a, a video capsule endoscopy to evaluate patients with celiac, um, you know, to basically see the course of the diagnosis, to see are you getting better, um, is intestinal lining getting better or not. So, of course, they're studying the test to make sure that's, um, you know, very specific, meaning that we can actually rely on this to say, yes, you're getting better. So that's still in, in study. So in the U.S., um, as far as I know, they're still using uh, biopsy to follow up uh, s some patients. I don't think they 
ever follow up with another biopsy to see if they're doing well or not. Um, so we'll see what comes about that. But this whole concept, it's interesting because what I'm trying to tell you guys is that it's important to know if you feel like you have a gluten intolerance, it's important that you have to be diagnosed to, to so you'll be able to follow up and pay attention to other symptoms that you might have that might be actually linked to this uh, disease. So it's, that's very important. Uh, thyroid problems, um, thyroiditis, hypothyroid, all those things also come along with celiac. So you, if you if you if I have a patient with celiac, I'm paying attention to all of these things because I know um, due to an autoimmune trigger, you can have thyroiditis, which means now you have an endocrinologist, a gastroenterologist, a primary doctor, a uh, you know all kinds of different doctors, and it, it, all it is we need to pay attention to your immune system and how you are responding to gluten or other triggers in your gut. I hope this was helpful. So I'll talk to you guys later.